I am a chim blade, a chim blade sweep. No bed to lie, no shoes to hold my feet. On a rooftop in dead of night, you'll hear me cry. I'll shake you from your sleep. Hear me, Your day will come in peace. For I am a poor and a wretched boy, a chimbley, chimbley Union. It is called cost, the bone, and what it lacks in beauty, it more than makes up for in strength. Appearing to grow out of its solid rock foundation, this 14th-century Gothic hrod casts an intimidating shadow over the Placanic Valley, an image David Allen Forbes is keen to capture with his pencil and paper. This will be his second book. Castles of the Zombie War, the Continent. The Englishman sits under a tree, his patchwork clothing and long Scottish sword already adding to this Arthurian setting. He abruptly switches gears as I arrive, from serene artist to painfully nervous storyteller. When I say that the New World doesn't have our history of fixed fortification, I'm only referring.
going to North America. There are the Spanish coastal fortresses, naturally, along the Caribbean, and the ones we and the French built in the Lesser Antilles. Then there are the Inca ruins in the Andes, although they never experienced direct sieges. Also, when I say North America, that does not include the Mayan Aztec ruins in Mexico. That business with the Battle of Kukulcan, although I suppose that's Toltec now, isn't it? When those chaps held off so many Z-heads on the steps of that bloody Great Pyramid. So when I say New World, I'm really referring to the United States and Canada. This isn't an insult, you understand. Please don't take it as such. You're both young countries. You don't have the history of institutional anarchy we Europeans suffered after the fall of Rome. You've always had standing national governments with the forces capable of enforcing law and order. I know that wasn't true during your westward expansion or your civil war. And please, I'm not discounting those pre-Civil War fortresses or the experiences of those defending them. I'd one day like to visit Fort Jefferson. I hear those who survived there had quite a time of it. All I'm saying is, in Europe's history, we had almost a millennia of living under institutional anarchy, where sometimes the concept of physical safety stopped at the battlements of your lord's castle. Does that make sense? I'm not making sense. C can we start again? No, no, this is fine. Please, continue. You'll edit out all of the daft bits. <laughs> you got it. Right then. Castles. Well, I don't want for a moment to overstate their importance for the general war effort. In fact, when you compare them to any other type of fixed fortification, modern, modified, and so forth, their contribution does seem quite negligible. Unless you're like me, and that contribution was what saved your life. This doesn't mean that a mighty fortress was naturally our god. For starters, you must understand the inherent difference between a castle and a palace. A lot of so-called castles were really nothing more than just great impressive homes, or else had been converted to such after their defensive value had become obsolete. Just look at Versailles. That was a first-rate cock-up. Small wonder the French government chose to build their national memorial on its ashes. Did you ever read that poem by Renard, about the wild roses that now grow in the memorial garden, their petals stained red with the blood of the damned? Yes, there were cock-ups aplenty. But there were also some noteworthy triumphs. Many were subjected to only short-term sieges, the good fortune of being on the right side of the line. Some in Spain, Bavaria or Scotland, above the Antonine, only had to hold out for a few weeks, or even days. For some, like Kissimul, it was only a question of getting through one rather dodgy night. Then there were the true tales of victory, like the Chenonceau in France, a bizarre little Disney-esque castle built on a bridge over the Chir River. With both connections to land severed and the right amount of strategic forethought, they managed to hold their position for years. They had enough supplies for years? Oh, good Lord, no. They simply waited for first snowfall, then raided the surrounding countryside. This was, I should imagine, standard procedure for almost anyone under siege, castle or not. I'm sure those in your strategic blue zones, at least those above the snow line, operated in much the same manner. In that way, we were fortunate that most of Europe freezes in winter. Many of the defenders I've spoken to 